Hi, I'm Kimberly Burrow, Managing Director of Legislation and Special Projects with the Penn Wharton Budget Model. And I'd like to introduce our next panel, which focuses on advances in public policy making. Um, we'll start with Kent Smetters. He's the Bettner Chair Professor in the Department of Business and Economics and Public Policy at the Wharton School. He's also our Faculty Director. Um, Kent has had previous positions in government and served on advisory panels. He's widely published and awarded. Kent. And I'd also like to introduce Stephen Goss. He's the Chief Actuary of the U.S. Social Security Administration. He's been the Chief Actuary since 2001. He's been there since 1973. Um, and he's going to talk about the 20th Annual Report of the Board of Trustees of the Social Security Administration. And then I'd like to introduce Tom Bartholz. He is the Chief of Staff of the Joint Committee on Taxation. He has been um, with the JCT since 1987 and Chief of Staff since 2009. He has years of experience with um, all taxes of all sorts and is also widely publicized. I give it to Kent to start the session. Thank you. Oh, he have my notes. There you go. So thanks, Kent, brother. Um, so we're going to, I mean, oh, do I have the, there we go. Thank you. Yes. Yes. All right. Excellent. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, advances in public policy, making tools and so forth, in particular what we've been working on uh, at the Penn Wharton budget model. And really, the, uh, very consistent with Steve's presentation. So I was asked during the break, what's the relationship with the USA Facts? In particular, we have a very shared database layer. Um, USA Facts is, is about history coming up to present day, and we're about uh, projecting forward. But the, it really is the same uh, core mission. It's really to move uh, from ideology to a much more rational discussion. We're about analysis. We're not about, you know, uh, we don't advocate, we don't recommend legislation or anything like that. Whether we really bring it as an institution, as an academic organization, what we really bring is uh, some deep uh, theoretical modeling, um, data analytics, but also the software development process, which is very integral to to what we do. And I want to point out, very, uh, e even though we produce a lot of numbers that the official scorekeepers uh, and government uh, people with me today uh, produce, we have a great respect for the, uh, uh, the scorekeepers. As, uh, scorekeepers, as Steve also pointed out, very tough job. And it is incredibly important, I think, to maintain their independence. Uh, versus approaching other countries where it's he heavily politicized. And I've, uh, my first job after my PhD was with CBO, great memories, uh, JCT right up the stairs, um, great memories. And they, uh, uh, the official scorekeepers have a lot of institutional knowledge as well. One of my own motivations, and it is very uh, similar to what Steve was also talking about, is where we're headed as a nation. In particular, it's a nonpartisan issue to say the debt projection is kind of is, uh, increasing dr dramatically. In particular, we're going to hit 100% of GDP in terms of the debt held by the public by the mid 2020s. And it is, uh, has a really per uh, big impact on the analysis. So, this uh, graph shows is what is the impact of debt? on GDP. And this is not about policy change. This is just the path that we're currently on. And that is, if the, the blue line is sometimes called a standard uh, static analysis, in this case looking at GNP, when we think about debt and international ownership of some of that debt, GNP is probably a little bit be better metric. And what we sh can show here is just on the current policy path, that if in fact uh, we allow for now debt effects, that is uh, what sometimes called dynamic effects, it includes the a tax cuts and jobs act, that is the, that more yellow line, debt has a, a tremendous impact. And in fact, uh, over time, almost we'll lose almost 20% of GDP just from the increase in debt under current law. Um, and it's simply because debt competes with household saving and international capital flows, and it has a crowd out effect. Uh, 
on uh, capital formation. Now, a lot of times people cherry pick evidence. They say, hey, Japan has carried high debt. Why can't we? Well, Japan also has a, a household saving rate 10 times that of the United States. As a national saving rate, it's actually quite high in Japan. Um, the, but the empirical evidence is very clear. Debt has very, very large nonlinear effects, um, and you don't see, you see a big effects when it's a, a small amount of debt, but it's big effects over time. And this is where a lot of the conventional models that have been used in Washington developed you know, over the decades, very easy to run, um, often easy to run on an Excel spreadsheet, things like that, but they're not picking up a lot of, the, uh, uh, of the, these nonlinear debt effects. I'll give you an example. There's obviously, you've heard of a universal basic income, been in the news, Hollywood actors making, a, making it very popular, where it hasn't caught on so much with economists, but it's been very much in the news. And the idea is that every, every family would get you know, basic income, regardless of their income. Um, and uh, one organization using a fairly standard Keynesian model suggested that a, a universal basic in income of $6,000 for every man, woman, and child would actually increase GDP through this purchasing power effect that is common in Keynesian models. Uh, when we did this exact same analysis, we found just the opposite effect. Instead of GDP going up in, in a decade by 7%, it went down by more than 7% simply because these uh, big debt effects. And it, it, the debt effects tend to be very nonlinear in the sense that when, in fact, uh, you have a lot of debt to begin with, adding more debt is even more impactful on the economy in terms of reducing uh, 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 GDP. GDP. And by the way, this graph here, that's the good news. The good news is, is this graph because we actually, some sense of cheat. At some point, the model doesn't solve. So we assume in 2040, the government gets its act together and stabilizes the debt GDP ratio um, wherever it happens to be at that point, sometimes known as the closure rule. Uh, heroic assumption, but if we did not do that, the economy would actually collapse. And it's such a big impact. So let's talk a little bit how we apply this to two issues. One's uh, tax and the other one is Social Security. Um, so in the case of tax analysis, this is a partial representation of our, of our, uh, of our platform, is that we start with households. Um, sometimes called a micro-SIM, sometimes called static scoring. So these households are hundreds of thousands of different types of households um, by all sorts of different characteristics. They grow up, they get married, maybe divorce, they get uh, education, college, have kids, uh, educate their kids, retire, and so forth. And this interacts with a tax module. It's very integrated uh, with it, and it feeds directly into this dynamic model. And the, the model that we're using, what's called the, over, the overlapping generations model, it's really the, the workhorse model of modern public economics. And it really is the model that I believe, because of its forward-looking aspect, that is more realistic and much more consistent with the empirical evidence by both the IMF, uh, Reinhardt and Rogoff, and so forth, that large, debt of, large amounts of debts can have very big nonlinear effects uh, over time. And I'm very happy that JCT uses the OLG model as one of their uh, core models as well. And we continue to push the OLG model uh, to, to really make sure uh, that we can add a lot, lot of more uh, details. And by the way, on our website, you can go to our website and under the simulations tab, in fact, there will be tablets in the in the atrium during lunchtime, you can actually look at simulation results for lots of different uh, 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 things. And so what we do with our modeling is we actually spend about 20% time coding, 80% time validating. So we always validate. In particular, we create these functional forms. We go back in time. We compare census data against micro, uh, our model prediction. All, we first do that uh, in order before we project forward. So in this case is uh, education. You can see the actual data, what the microSIM would have predicted, how, how it matches up, and then the microSIM goes off into the, into the future with disability. We, have, we do this with across dozens of different tests. These are just some examples of uh, family composition as well. That matters a lot as you move into the future. Uh, uh, wage income deciles for inequality, even marriage rates, uh, and many other variables. Um, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act um, is, of course, as you know, broken into uh, several components. One is the individual side, and certainly the new rate structure, um, the pass-through provisions really uh, are, 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 are 
were costly uh, aspects, and some of the pass-through deductions were not always well under, understood by kind of the media. It's, it's, we want to talk a little bit about that. And in this table, we compare our numbers with the Joint Committee on Taxation uh, uh, numbers, who are the official scorekeepers, uh, both over the next 10 years as well as going over a, a longer time period. Since we you, uh, match our census data to IRS data, we're able, uh, we uh, always want to give a longer term aspect as, as well. And in particular, uh, the, in the, uh, these slides will be online if you want to look at them, but it, they're also in a lot of our, our, our briefs that we've posted. The individual side has lots of different components. I won't go through in a lot of detail. The corporate side, um, obviously everybody's familiar with the rate change from 35% to 21%. I emphasize that the treatment of investment here as well. Um, it seems like a very small um, loss of revenue, and we'll come back to that in just a little bit. In the old days, that used to be a really costly item. Why is it so cheap um, here by both of our measures? Where we differ by $100 billion on it, but still, sometimes that's often you know, a trillion dollars or more. And then you have some uh, offsets going the opposite direction, like for amortization and so forth. And the international system would take too long to, to talk about moving to, to territorial. In the aggregate, our, our numbers work are, in fact, uh, about $500 billion more in lost revenue um, than uh, the, the Joint Committee on Taxation. Some of this was uh, about uh, $100 billion or so is, is from various income shifting and reclassification, which they also take into account. And in particular, there they are um, uh, the, the Tax Act, because of its expiring provisions, as another incentives really has the incentive for you to shift the years of where, where your income officially gets reported, but also the type of income. Uh, as a uni university professor, I really should convince Penn to hire me off, not as a W-2, but as an independent contractor. Um, that's going to save a lot of money, and then I should divide myself up between a service company and a software manufacturer. That would do things as, as well for my tax bill. Um, but uh, there's quite a bit of, kind of, uh, of reclassification. And this reclassification by the way, it's not just, uh, some of it's W-2 to C-Corp or pass-through, um, but don't think of it always as uh, going from C-Corp to pass-through. In fact, we sh our recent analysis shows that a lot of it is actually going to go from pass-through to, to C-Corp. You can actually go onto our website, there's a kind of a calculator there that if you're a, a business, you can actually put in your details and see if you're better off as a C-Corp or as a pass-through. And then we had dynamic effects, that was the static element that goes into our dynamic model. There's a big debate in D.C. how you mishmash uh, kind of short-run models with long-run models. Uh, and in this case, uh, we're able to have both uh, these Keynesian effects in the short run uh, along with uh, longer-run uh, effects. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time. This is more of a debate in Washington and or amongst tax uh, folks about this, how you, uh, this low R versus high R, in particular how you calibrate the model initially. But generally speaking, we get a, a, a bump in GDP in the short run, and then um, uh, GDP doesn't increase substantially uh, very much. Most of it's driven by capital services. So it looks like you get this Keynesian effects in the short run, as well as uh, 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 capital effects. And then federal tax revenues, as well known, uh, the, the system loses a lot in, uh, in revenue, but eventually from dynamic effects, uh, things eventually uh, uh, recover. But in the meanwhile, you've uh, lost a lot of in revenue. So regardless of your assumptions, though, uh, whether you use a more favorable assumption for tax reform, which is uh, this initial uh, high return to capital versus a low return to capital, that's a theoretical debate in, in these models. Um, the key about this is that the, on an annualized basis, uh, the, what we predict is that the, that the tax act will lead to uh, annualized increase of growth of only about 0.06% per year to maybe 0.12% per year, which is, uh, and it actually goes down over time because of debt effects. And why, and this is much below the 0.4% that was very common, the discussed in Washington. Is there was a common belief in Washington if we could just get growth increase by 0.4% a year, this tax reform would actually pay for itself. By the way, that number was actually never 
correct. And the reason why, that came from a CBO study. The CBO study was itself fine, but the CBO study wasn't about tax reform. It was on the current, on the pre-reform tax base, a, a rule of thumb. But when you go to a new tax base, which is a smaller tax base, that 0.4% is not the correct number anymore. It was actually 0.55% relative to current uh, 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 policy and about 0.7% relative to the current law. So we're uh, quite a bit below that f from this thing paying for itself. So why don't we get bigger effects? It is really driven by debt effects. Um, in particular, we get substantial debt effects in, in the model. And in particular, this, a lot of this debt is not financing new investment. It's actually financing a lot of existing investment. And you can see this with the corporate effective tax rates. In particular, these are effective tax rates. As you know, companies don't really pay the statutory rate. Um, they have various deductions and so forth, even before the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And before the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, Act. We have this broken down by industry, but overall, about 21% uh, was the effective tax rate uh, that companies were actually paying. Um, it goes down under the, the, job, uh, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Uh, but notice by 2027, it returns a lot of the way. What's going on is that how the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act uh, basically works is that you get this expensive provision over a limited amount of investment over the first five years, and that expensing it basically is mostly just shifting the depreciation that companies would have already enjoyed over that 10-year window. It is better, they're better off in present value a bit, uh, but that's also one reason why that investment category was so cheap in the sense that most of it is shifting. Um, uh, it's essentially an interest-free loan against your f a future tax bill. And so it really is not, uh, it's uh, uh, focused a lot on kind of new, new investment. Let me talk talk a little bit, a uh, uh, fewer minutes on Social Security, um, because this platform is really about lots of different uh, analysis. On, tr on Social Security uh, that uh, Steve will also uh, discuss on is, uh, uh, yes, we have slightly different projections on the, the Social Security exhaustion date. Um, we'll, we'll put that in quotes. It's not the official term anymore. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, in, it's, uh, it, depending on the assumptions, we can be a little bit closer to what CBO has projected or what Social Security uh, projects. I think, personally, the exhaustion date or depreciation uh, date is the, is the minor issue. For me, the bigger issue is that, in fact, we're, we're going to have substantial shortfalls in Social Security that is uh, interacting with these, these uh, substantial de debt effects. You can go on our website. You can uh, run 4,096 combinations of how to fix Social Security and so forth. We're releasing our new version of Social Security Simulator um, in just a little bit. But let me give you some highlights here. And let me uh, talk about some straw man ideas, uh, packages. We're not advocating this. We're just taking what's commonly discussed out there and saying, let's Let's look at three straw man uh, ideas here. And the one that we call this the liberal plan, mostly getting more, uh, fixing Social Security through increases in tax revenue. That would be a tax, a payroll tax increase, um, as well as what's called the donut hole. The idea is that uh, you, you, in fact, have a uh, current earnings cap, and so you can apply this new tax up to the earnings cap. Uh, but then the idea is you have this donut hole where uh, beyond that earnings cap, you're not taxed. But then, after you make it, uh, enough money, you're taxed again at, at another rate. And that donut hole is the, is the area in between that you're not taxed. And so suppose you have the donut hole $500,000, um, and that's not indexed to inflation. So eventually what's going to happen, that donut hole will shrink over time, and so the payroll tax will, in fact, be levied over a uh, larger and larger uh, wage base. And we won't give you any credit for paying this, this, donut, uh, this tax above the donut hole. Uh, the conservative idea is more of let's, let's increase the retirement age, um, let's uh, fiddle with the adjustment, inflation adjustment, let's cut benefits upon a progressive basis. And then the balance is a combination of the two. Uh, two of the more liberal ones, a payroll tax increase, uh, as well as a, a smaller donut hole uh, application, a progressive benefit uh, uh, cut from the more conservative uh, plan. And again, we're, these are, we're not advocating. These are obviously extremely simple. The purpose is straw 
comment, but I'm trying to make a bigger point here. And that is all three of these would, in fact, quote, unquote, save the trust fund. And in particular, here is our, the blue line. It's a projection of the trust fund of the current law, the, or we call current policy. I'll come back to that in a second. And the dotted lines are for the, uh, for the, the conservative, liberal, and balance. Now, they save the trust fund in, two, in very different ways. The liberal one gets money immediately, but then tracks the kind of the current policy uh, income surplus. So the income surplus, this is how much money that you, in fact, are, 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 pay, are paying out versus how much money you're, you're taking in uh, in taxes. And, in fact, it's actually, uh, just, just realize that that should have been taxes less uh, benefits, my bad. Um, so, but anyways, it's taxes less benefits, not benefits less taxes. But in any case, the income surplus um, uh, line is the blue line. It's going way down over time. These are in constant year dollars, 2016 dollars. We're going to have a $300 billion shortfall in this trust fund exhaust. That is going to increase to over a trillion dollars a year in, in current dollars um, if nothing is done. And so these different plans will, will attack it differently. The, 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 the more conservative approach um, is because the, 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 it relies a lot on the retirement age increasing slowly over time. It's going to wear in uh, much slower and so forth. And the balanced approach. But the key about it, if you look at those approaches relative to the GDP, they all have, yes, no, no question, the conservative one is going to have a bigger impact, a bigger positive impact on GDP. And that's simply because when you take away some benefits, people are forced to save. That's going to lead to more capital accumulation and so forth. But even the, even the liberal and the balanced ones, the impact on GDP is not substantially negative. Um, and in particular, it's, it's, uh, in the case of the balance, it's still actually a little bit higher GDP under the balance than it is under the current law. What is going on, and this will be my last slide here, it really is, what do we really mean, why well, I should say relative to the current policy? What do we really mean? What's the benchmark? So there's two ways of thinking about Social Security. The one is current law. Current law would basically, one interpretation of that would be, hey, you know what? Trust fund runs out of money. We have 75% you know, of revenue coming in that can pay, uh, revenue that comes in that can pay about 75% worth of benefits. And so at that point, we just, you know, slash benefits by a quarter or more, including on your nine-year-old -year grandmother, and it, that's, that's just kind of tough. And by definition, therefore, there is, in fact, no problem. And the reason why there's no problem is because you're just going to slash benefits to meet um, the, re the resources that, that you have. I think, uh, so therefore, anything that you do to basically save the trust fund of new taxes would, would be negative relative to that simply because um, there's nothing going to be more positive on the economy than forcing people to save uh, uh, more themselves. Um, but at the same time, that's probably very implausible. We're really not going to slash benefits relative on a 90-year-old person. So, but relative to current policy, um, it, by current policy, the idea would be if we think of Social Security as a, just a part of the unified budget. And that is, in fact, you know, uh, it's not technically true, it's technically off budget, but we all, you know, think about the unified surplus measure or the deficit, that's the CBO measure that everybody uh, focuses on. Um, it, but if we think of it now as part of the, the entire budget, interestingly, that, e it, that e e even uh, the balance plan that has tax increases is actually going to be more positive on GDP than current policy because the current policy in that case basically means when you have these shortfalls, they become debt. And debt is even more negative on the economy than uh, uh, using new revenue uh, uh, mechanisms. And so clearly, it, 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 when it comes to Social Security, quicker action is going to be more effective. Um, by the way, the distinction between a benefit cut and a tax increase is in many ways, it's a huge debate, but in many ways artificial because, in fact, your benefits are, in fact, linked to your earnings, which are, in fact, linked to your payroll contributions. And so as a result of that, there's a marginal linkage. If I cut benefits in a progressive way versus increasing taxes in a progressive way, that distinction is actually very minor. 
Um, both are, in fact, in a, a increase in taxes or in a net uh, lifetime sense, having the same resource impact, or you could design it to have the same resource impact on higher income people. And so as a result of that, you know, I, th I think what we really need is, is holistic modeling uh, like this that allows for the impact on, on GDP um, and as well as distributional effects that we haven't reported here, um, but it, it, that it really does recognize um, that, uh, that sometimes labels uh, really don't matter very much. So, uh, so now I want to, uh, I think Tom will go first. And again, as I mentioned earlier this morning, have in tremendous, you know, we, we, we view our job as really trying to be helpful to the, to the official experts um, in, in this area. So we really welcome their comments and have told them to, you know, uh, say whatever they want. <laughs> We're very encouraged uh, that they're, they're here to talk. Tom, do you want to stay with okay. I'll, I'll, I'll sit. Uh, well, thank you, Kent, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak uh, to everyone uh, today. Um, since Kimberly introduced uh, me by saying I've been at the Joint Committee for a long time, I thought maybe in terms of my comments uh, I'd take the uh, gray hair uh, approach uh, and step, step back a little bit, ask uh, what's really, uh, in a broad sense, what's behind uh, uh, the, the uh, Penn Wharton uh, budget model uh, initiative, uh, and, and that's really why do, we, why do we have models for uh, public policy analysis? And it's because we're trying to have both qualitative and uh, quantitative guidance uh, to provide policymakers, our elected, uh, our elected representatives, in making decisions that uh, are important for our future. Um, this is not new. Uh, so what we're talking about uh, today, or what uh, the work uh, that Kent uh, has presented, is uh, properly titled uh, advances. He's trying to talk about where we are now. We'll think about a little bit about uh, where we've come because I think that also highlights some potential problems or things to think about in terms of where we are now. Uh, I won't go back to the founding of the Republic, but uh, if we go back to the uh, Kennedy round of tax cuts, um, for those of you that are old enough, for those of you that have read some history, you'll know that uh, they were to a large degree based on what we now consider fairly simple, but some simple economic modeling. You can read the Council Economic Advisors uh, uh, report with some projections of what would happen to uh, income and federal revenues uh, if, taxes, uh, if taxes were cut, notwithstanding a short-run change in the deficit. Similarly, economic modeling was important in terms of motivating the pol uh, policy choice that led to the uh, income tax surcharge, uh, surtax of 1968 and 1969. But as you've gone, if you step forward into the next decade, you find out that our knowledge, our modeling is always a little bit imperfect. We, learn, we find out that there are a lot of things we don't know. So think of the twin energy shocks in the, uh, in the 1970s. And what did economic modeling have to tell us at the time about that? Um, not much. In fact, still trying to figure out a lot about what went on in the 1970s and, and why. What created uh, uh, stagflation? So I think when we think, about the model, uh, when we think about modeling, what modeling can tell us, uh, it's important to think through the models and to remember that our knowledge is, uh, is imperfect. Kent uh, mentioned uh, what many see as the anomaly of Japan and the deficits in Japan, noted that Japan has very high saving rates, so the net uh, saving rate in Japan is in fact uh, quite, uh, quite high. But notwithstanding, I think, the evidence that uh, uh, Kent cited, we don't have perfect knowledge about the effects of uh, deficits on the economy, in particular uh, the timing uh, or magnitude. And so when Kent uh, just described that he said, well, uh, if I don't do this, the economy will collapse. Uh, he was saying the economy of the Penn Wharton model uh, will collapse. Uh, he can't tell you that, uh, what was the end year, was it 2040? He can't tell you that in 2040, under current policy, that the U.S. economy will, uh, uh, will collapse. Well, he, how have policymakers uh, really uh, evolved in terms of uh, analysis as, as well? As I noted, it was important in the, uh, in the 1960s, trying to figure out what to do was important in the 1970s. Uh, with increasing uh, deficits in the 1980s, you saw a lot of emphasis uh, put on 
uh, uh, projections of what was going to happen to the federal deficit. I think in terms of budget scorekeeping, it put a lot of pressure on uh, scorekeeping and on estimates. Uh, also put a lot of pressure on policymakers of how do they beat the model. If they know what the model is, uh, maybe they can have a policy that's consistent with the model, so consistent with the rules that, we set, uh, that uh, they establish, uh, but also achieves a policy goal that you know, they, they find uh, um, advantageous for a number of other, other reasons. Um, started off with many five-year uh, uh, policy, uh, policy horizons, uh, but members thought uh, uh, that five years was somewhat inadequate, so we've moved now to a 10-year planning horizon. We look at that in terms of cash flow, the deficits that uh, Kent's measuring are all measured on a cash flow basis. Of course, we know economically there are a number of uh, people that uh, model out uh, lifetime, uh, uh, lifetime deficits, uh, generational, uh, generational accounting, a number of different ways to, uh, to, look, uh, to look at this, but the federal government kind of operates on this cash flow basis. So we've moved from five years to looking at 10 years. Social Security Administration, for a number of good reasons, looks at an even longer, uh, a longer horizon. In the last round of uh, discussion of budget resolution, uh, a number of members of Congress contemplated moving to a 20-year budget, uh, uh, budget planning horizon. Putting longer horizons on our modeling puts greater uncertainty uh, uh, on the outcomes. Uh, uh, we probably feel a lot better about knowing um, uh, what, how the population will change over the next two, three years than we do over the next 20, uh, over the next 20 years, and in terms of just people filing returns, uh, the number of people out there is an important uh, factor in terms of, uh, in terms of defining our, t uh, our tax base. Something else that you've seen uh, uh, arise over the past uh, now three decades with the importance of thinking about the cash flow deficit, about the modeling, about the scorekeeping, is you've seen the rise of a lot of other uh, organizations willing to offer quantitative economic analysis. Uh, you've seen uh, in the Washington, D in the inside the beltway uh, uh, group, uh, you've seen accounting firms uh, establish their own uh, uh, independent uh, uh, modeling. They often uh, use this to uh, uh, talk to members about policy, policy proposals, coalitions, uh, advocate broad reforms, uh, are often uh, employing now outside, uh, uh, outside modelers. See, think tanks have created their own uh, uh, broad uh, uh, models, some to think about uh, American Enterprise Institute, the Tax Foundation, the Tax, uh, uh, tax Policy Center. Penn Wharton uh, budget model would be another, uh, another example. More analysis, taking different approaches, thinking through that. I think we have to think, you know, professionally, that's all, all good to think about uh, how, to, how to group A approach it, how to group B approach it, because knowledge is not, uh, is not perfect, everything is not, uh, is not known. But also something else that comes, uh, that we found uh, 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 on our staff, uh, that we found with increased, model, uh, increased modeling, increased ideas, the positive aspect of it, is from a policymaker's uh, perspective, there's often a lot more noise. Um, each model, to the extent that it's different, if there's a different outcome, well, they want to know which one's right. Uh, why, is, why is Kent's better or worse than, uh, uh, than the tax foundations? Or why is the tax policy centers better or worse than the American Enterprise uh, uh, Institute? So with more models, and I'll call it more noise, and I don't mean that uh, uh, pejorative, uh, pejoratively, maybe in a few cases I do, mm. but not, uh, not, as a uniform, uh, not as a uniform statement, mm. comes in increasing pressure for what's behind the, the models. You know, a real popular buzzword for us is, is transparency. So there's pressure to spend more time explaining where the, uh, uh, where the results come from, what's underlying the model, what are the assumptions. What are the, uh, what's, the, um, uh, what's the data? Uh, if you go flip back, uh, and, and I won't uh, uh, really take any time uh, uh, on it, uh, if you flip, flip back to the charts that uh, Kent presented, he presented some differences. He had a, a comment at the one, well, he found that his total uh, was much closer to 
CBO's recent projections than what he was representing as uh, the Joint Committee's projections. Well, a basic question on that is CBO's ba most recent projections uh, are based on the 2018 macroeconomic baseline. The Joint Committee estimates that he was reporting from for uh, Public Law 115.97 is based on the CBO 2017 macroeconomic baseline. CBO 2018 macroeconomic baseline forecast greater economic growth for 2018, 2019, 2020 than did the 2017 baseline. That leads to potentially a significant effect, uh, effect there. Um, so we don't, know what the base, uh, we don't know what the baseline is. That we found in a number of uh, discussions uh, tends to uh, confuse the policy ma uh, makers. Uh, and I don't mean confused in that they can't figure that it out, but they'll sometimes be talking past, uh, past each other. Uh, so it makes it hard to center in on what the real, uh, sometimes what the real, uh, what the real issue is. Um, I, and so I, uh, I guess to, uh, since I'm down to eight seconds, I'll, uh, <laughs> uh, I'll, I want to emphasize that in working through um, the, the uh, uh, analysis that the Penn Wharton model uh, can offer, it's important to think about what's behind it. Uh, and how to explain it, because for the policy decision process, be it the qualitative aspect of it or the quantitative aspect, the policymakers increasingly want to know where it's, where it's coming from uh, and, and why. Uh, and they want to understand it because they want to think of what's the ramification and if I modify uh, my option some, why is that result differently? What's going to drive, uh, what's going to drive that result? Uh, but um, with that, I'll turn the time, uh, time back. Okay. Excellent. Thanks. Uh, great. Uh, thank you, Kent. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Steve Ballmer starting out. Uh, great setup for discussion. I, I guess I'd like to suggest, first of all, the work that we do in our office at Social Security Administration, Office of the Actuary. Uh, we make, as Tom and Ken have both mentioned, we make projections out for 75 years, sometimes even further, uh, on what the actuarial financial status of the Social Security Trust Funds will be. And in order to do that, uh, we have to make projections of the entire U.S. population, all the aspects that Tom was mentioning, uh, the U.S. economy, uh, and everything that deals more directly with Social Security. Uh, and I guess what I'd want to suggest is what we really specifically do is in some sense broader and in some sense narrower than what's been discussed so far. Uh, I think both Kent and Tom are talking a little bit more about the revenue tax side, and we, of course, look much much more kind of balanced between the two as we need to in order to see how the two of them are working out. Uh, we're, we're narrower, on the other hand, uh, because we do not look as broadly to the total federal budget, uh, and we look more at really just the operations of Social Security. That said, one of the other distinctions is that we're in a pure budget model uh, that uh, I know Tom is working on every day and, uh, and Kent also. You have to worry about every single thing, not only in the economy, which we all worry about, but also all aspects of federal uh, changes, federal interventions that might occur. We look a little bit past that in our projections. We basically look towards the future of the economic growth as being a little bit like what Kent was saying past 2040, that things will work their way out, uh, that things can go off the rails only so much, things will happen. We don't explicitly try to indicate what will happen for the overall federal budget in order to keep it in order, uh, because as has been cited sometimes in the past, if budget deficits were to rise to the extent that some have projected, interest rates could possibly rise to a point where that would cause the budget deficits to rise even more, and pretty soon you get a death spiral, and it just doesn't work. So at some point you have to assume that things will sort of work out, and we do that basically. Now that said, with respect to tax changes and tax implications, this is where we spend a lot of time with our friend Tom. He gets probably more emails from us than, than, than he would want to say, because when we do have specific things of tax legislation that would have an effect on the overall tax base, the economy, and also specific uh, tax revenues coming to the Social Security Trust Funds, uh, we do talk to Tom and people at Office Tax Analysis at Treasury. Speaking of which, I, I do have to sort of give a, a sort of a mea culpa here. Uh, uh, Earlier, Kent asked for us to be hard on his model and everything, so I have to do full disclosure. I did spend four years' time at Penn 
uh, in, an, in an earlier life, but that doesn't mean that I would be any less harsh on Kent, because we've also done time together when he was at Treasury some time back and, uh, and had some great discussions. Sometimes in disagreements comes out the best warning, uh, and, and it was really, really wonderful. So let me jump into a couple of little slides here. I won't spend a lot of time on these. Uh, the legislative mandate for our trustees for the Social Security Administration and for Medicare, for that matter, to do these longer-term projections really is in the law. We've got to do uh, we've, we've got to say what we think over the next five years, as Tom was saying, uh, this is because this legislation goes back a while. We've gone pretty much to 10 years and, old, old, and more recent focus. But also we have to look at the actual status of the programs, which has to go out a lot further because we want to be able to show Congress what is expected to happen over basically the course of the, the remaining lifetime of our youngest participants, a 20-year-old in the workforce. So we've got to run out something like 75 years to give you an idea. Uh, just a real quick thing in, in our uh, in our most recent trustees report that came out just earlier this month, uh, a couple of things happened. We changed our economic projections a little bit more conservative uh, than before based on the not very good uh, labor productivity growth that we've had in recent years. But I would cite, however, that uh, our projections for economic growth over the next 10 years and even beyond are more optimistic than CBO, but less optimistic than the president's budget. So we figure we're in a pretty good place here. We're sort of, you know, we have them on, on either side of us. Uh, the, the other really big thing is that we've had massive changes in disability, uh, uh, disability applications coming into our programs, not only Social Security, but also uh, into the SSI program. Uh, you can see here, we do pay attention now. Kent, Kent, this is one thing where Kent and I would disagree a little bit about the idea of trust fund reserve to Completion. That's the little joke is we're not really sure exactly what a what a trust fund looks like when it is an exhausted trust fund. But when the reserves in the trust fund become depleted, uh, then we do have an issue, as, as Kent well described. Then we still have continuing revenue that can pay a portion of what is scheduled in the law for benefits, what the obligation is, but not all of it. And the reason why we think the reserve depletion date is important is just simply a look back at history. If you look at when the Congress has actually acted and has made changes. It's when we're at or approaching very soon reserve depletion. You can just see throughout the whole history of the program uh, that this, this is absolutely the case. You can see, for example, the little blue line on the bottom, the disability insurance program. You can see two places at which it bounced. Those were tax rate reallocations that had been done simply between the OESI and DI funds, the most recent one, in 2015. And you can also see that we've had some rather dramatic improvement in the actual status of the DI fund going forward. And this is where we have to, as you know, Tom and Kent were both mentioning, we have to have full disclosure and full understanding of what the assumptions we are, but paying very, very careful attention, as Steve Ballmer mentioned, to what the evolution is of new data. And here's a look at new data. These are applications coming to Social Security. You can see the applications coming to Social Security for disability benefits peaked in 2010. Big surprise. We had this great recession. Uh, but they've been dropping ever since. Now you can see how badly we have done on projecting the applications turning back up to what we think would be more of a steady state situation. All the way through 2017, they just keep dropping. We're working on trying to understand exactly why. It's a great news story. It's good for the solvency of the DI fund. Uh, it's good for a, a window into the American people, not as many people feeling they're disabled. Uh, we'd like to be doing better projections, and we're, we're working on that by way of trying to understand what's there. Similarly, the disability incidence rates, this is the percentage of people who are insured but not yet receiving a benefit already, uh, who start to receive a benefit in a given year. And you can see that again peaked in 2010. It's been dropping like crazy. Uh, and uh, we're projecting that it's going to turn around, as we have been for a while, but these turnarounds have simply not been happening. Again, good news, uh, speaking more to the uncertainty, not just in the very long term, but even in the near term. Uh, and this all actually shows you relative to the black line back in our 2008 trustees report, which is the last year we had projections. And Kent, you might even have been with us then. I'm mm. trying to remember. Uh, this is before anybody knew there was a recession right on the horizon, the assumptions we had. And you can see our steady growth in the number of disabled worker beneficiaries. We thought it would just be rising, just following the population, the aging of the population. As it turned out, the recession on the red line, you can see to the left of today's history, 
We had a big bump in the recession. No surprise in that. But you can see the extent to which we have given that back in terms of the number of people receiving benefits. And even from last year's trustees report to the most recent trustees report, we're even lower now in the numbers of beneficiaries. And the trend is going very, very negative. Quite different from what most people had thought in recent years. Now, to, to the cash flow issue that Kent was talking about, we obviously pay attention to that. I would have to tell you we do not tend to look at these in dollar amounts, especially not now, now in the budget. When you're looking at just 10 years, looking at nominal dollars, that's fine. We kind of have a sense of that. If we're going to go out more than 10 years, we think nominal dollars really don't make any sense at all because, you know, a nominal dollar out in 2050 compared to today, how, how can we fathom the $55 loaf of bread? Uh, I'm probably out of date on that because I'm used to thinking back when I was a kid, it was maybe under a buck for a loaf of bread. I guess that's no more. Uh, so so we, we don't even like to look at, at so-called constant dollars, which are CPI indexed, because the economy tends to work with real growth. So we think that's a little bit you know, tough to look out beyond 10 years. So we prefer to look at things relative to, in this case, our taxable payroll. Uh, which is about 35% of the total GDP. You can also look at your dollar amounts going out further into the future as a percentage of GDP. We have a slide on that. And this simply just shows on the red line what the revenue to the DI, Disability Insurance Trust Fund, is looking like as a share of our taxable payroll. And the blue line is the cost. And you can see back in the recession period where the cost rose up above the money coming in. There we go. Our trust fund reserves started to come down. You can see the little bump up where the Congress most recently gave us a shot at some extra money uh, coming in from the tax rate reallocation. Uh, and in the future, you can see what the shortfall is because the projected cost of providing all the benefits is on the dashed line. But the dark blue line is what we will actually be able to pay. And here's the interesting thing about the DI trust fund, why we have had such rather dramatic multiple year extensions in our projected year of reserve depletion. And that's because we're at a point now where even if we reach the point in 2032 where we project reserve depletion, we're still going to have 96 cents coming in in revenue for every dollar of projected benefits. What that means is that you don't have to have much of a change in the amount of revenue you have in the trust fund around 2032 to give you a couple more years. Uh, so, you know, you know, stand by and we'll see what happens. If anything, there's a, a very distinct possibility that we could be going out further on that reserve depletion date just based on our, our recent experience. Similar thing here for the OESDI program as a whole, a little bit difference here. We would drop down to about 79 cents on the dollar at reserve depletion in 2034, going down to 74 cents. That's actually a little bit better than we had in last year's projection. Uh, as I mentioned, percent of GDP, which is maybe in the context of what we're talking about here over the longer term, a better thing to look at. And you can see Social Security used to be, you know, about 4.3, 4.5% of GDP was the cost over the last 20, 30 years prior to the recession and prior to demographic changes, which are really the big driver here. You can see we're going to jump from just over 4 up to 6% of GDP in the future. Uh, this is a serious issue. And obviously, if your tax rates stay the same and your percent of GDP cost goes up a lot, you have an issue. Why is that? Well, we have this thing called the age of dependency ratio, what demographics is destiny. You can see in the black line, this is simply the ratio of the number of people 65 and older in our population as a percentage of the what we used to think of as working age, 20 to 64 population. And you can see that that's going to go up like crazy. Why? Because the boomers are, ever since 2008, moving into retirement age, no surprise. We knew that would be happening. But what has also happened is because of low birth rates after the boomers, which is why we call them boomers, because after them came lower birth rates, we're going to have lower birth rate generations filling the labor force, and we already do, which is going to cause this ratio to go up. Just to get a better feel for that, you can see the other two lines below. Those are what if, at the end of the baby boom generation, we'd stated either 3.3 .3 births per woman, uh, which is what we'd average from 1946 to 65, or if we'd even just been at three births per woman, which is sort of a much more longer-term past average, you can see this age of dependency ratio would not have been going up like we're projecting now, and therefore the cost as percentage of payroll, cost as percentage of GDP would not be going up. It would be very, very similar. Uh, death rates have not been a, a big factor. In fact, uh, people used to think death rates are going to be dropping like a rock for a while, but since 2009 they have not for a number of reasons. It's not just opioids because death rates have really ceased dropping to the extent that they had been at essentially all ages and both genders. Uh, 
Speaking to uncertainty, we have a couple of different ways of illustrating uncertainty that speak to really all the various assumptions we have on, in the trustee's report. But I did want to just take one more second, even though I'm at zero seconds here, but, I, but, <laughs> but, but Ken said so we, we could take just a minute more, to speak just a tiny little bit about the budget scoring issue. Uh, and again, the focus of the trustee's reports by law and by what we do is to really focus on the solvency, the viability, uh, the actual status of the trust funds. And the thing that's important there is if we did reach the point of trust fund reserve depletion, the trust funds have, let's see, how much authority do the trust funds have to borrow? Well, actually none. The trust funds have no borrowing authority. That's why I think both Tom and Kent were saying if we reach the point of reserve depletion and in 2032 for DI only had 96 cents on the dollar coming in, something would have to be done. And the key here is the Congress has every single time in the past we've approached a point where a change in law would be necessary and in order to maintain the benefits, they have changed the law. They've stepped up and made changes every single time. So reserve depletion has really been the motivation for Congress to make changes. Uh, we would all wish that changes would be made sooner rather than later. That would be nice. But when your back is against the wall, you really have to act. If the trust funds, like the rest of government, had the ability to borrow, which is Tom, what, over $20 trillion now? Remember, this is the rest of government that has over $20 trillion of borrowing. The Social Security Trust Funds actually are to the plus of $2.9 trillion. So there's no borrowing by Social Security. In fact, there can't be. And, in fact, the roughly $20 trillion borrowed by the rest of the government, which is the full debt subject to limit, $3 trillion of that has actually been borrowed from the Social Security Trust Funds. Uh, and, and this then gets to the issue of when we are looking at Social Security now on the path towards starting to spend down some of its trust fund reserves, should we look at that really a uh, matter of putting pressure on the budget and creating problems? Or is it a matter of Social Security has been putting money in since 1983 because of the 1983 amendments, building up its savings account, uh, which Kent was saying is such a good idea earlier, building up the savings account and then we'll start drawing it down. Our, our hope, our sense is that all the financial markets and everybody in government well understands because we've been putting out in these trustees' reports every year, that where the trust funds were saving and putting away excess money into this, allowing the rest of the government to borrow less from the public, less publicly held debt than there would otherwise be by $3 trillion now, that if the trust funds, as has been projected for many, many years, now starts to spend down those reserves, that simply means the rest of the government will now have to start to realize that $3 trillion that so far has been borrowed from the trust funds, they will have to borrow it from the public. And that should not really be a shock to anybody. We would like to hope that this would not be a shock to the financial markets or to anybody else in their expectations for GDP in the future, because this is information that's all well known. So that's the, the one thing that I just wanted to sort of mention about the budget scoring issue. The budget scoring convention, I think we're all familiar with this, it's, it's, it's not just CBO, OMB, and everybody else, is to in effect presume that the trust fund programs, Social Security, and Medicare, if they reach a point where they deplete the reserves, there's this implicit assumption that a law will suddenly come forth that will allow all the benefits to still be paid and the money will come, well, I guess it will just come out of the general fund of the Treasury requiring a lot more borrowing from the public. Uh, and I mean, that's fine if you want to make that assumption. All I would just suggest is if you're going to put that forth as a budget scoring convention, be really straight about it and indicate it and don't just show the rising debt without, uh, without sort of illustrating that. And one little illustration of that is this thing here that we had based on some 2017 CBO projections. We just put the little green and, and purple lines in here of what the debt would be projected based on CBO's 2017 baseline if you did not assume that the shortfalls for Social Security and Medicare would be made up by money that is not allowable under law and has no precedent uh, under, under, under any law to be able to be provided. And I'm really tickled that Kent's going to be doing longer-term projections out here, all the way at, out to at least 75 years, yeah, we hope. Yeah. Great. That will allow us to sort of look at this kind of distinction. We'll hope that Kent will similarly look at this distinction going into the future. Uh, the last thing I just want to say is uh, we have a whole bunch of, uh, would love to have the time to talk about ways of changing. Mm -hmm. Social Security can't touch nicely on that. But we have a whole bunch of stuff up on our web page where we do have full disclosure of all the assumptions, all the methods, and everything else. So I wish Steve Ballmer were here still so we could say, Steve, here's another source of data to look at. Yeah, yeah. No, that's fantastic, Abby. It, uh, why don't we, uh, if you have questions, and uh, thanks for both those comments, if you want, okay, you have some there. 
And I think we probably have about 10 minutes or, or so, yeah. Um, yeah, go ahead. So, yeah, please uh, please uh, submit some more questions on cards, or if you feel comfortable um, speaking publicly, you can head up to the mic as well. I'm going to start off with um, maybe one that all three of you can talk about. So Kent was saying that Penn Wharton budget model is a cutting-edge model. Um, what do you think about what makes a model cutting-edge or can differentiate models from one to the other? And also... Uh, why exactly is the closure rule necessary, and is there types of models where you don't need that kind of assumption? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll go quite quickly, and I completely agree with uh, Tom's point in that it's such a crowded space, especially on the tax side, you know, trying to understand um, differences in, in models. Well, all of our documentation is also online, and if anything, it's probably overwhelming. And that, 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 that is an issue as well. Um, it, it, so the way we can think about the Penn Wharton budget model, why we did it, is because we were on, um, really trying to do uh, a couple of things. The first one is to uh, have, if we take tax as an example, a, a fully integrated tax platform that is, in fact, integrated not with just tax by itself, because lots of the models that were out there really simplify a lot on the tax side. I and mean, it's not, not JCT, but a lot of the other, what you, you, what you mentioned, um, other models really simplified a lot of that. Um, but then have that interact with the actual census level data. And so, in fact, even though economists spend so much time talking about dynamics and how important dynamics are, in fact, micro simulation and the static stuff is still crucial, um, and really getting that right because that ultimately feeds into the, the, the to the dynamic model. The dynamic model itself, what is more cutting edge about it is is this uh, the fact that it's this overlapping generations model that has incorporates all sorts of uncertainty um, and other uh, very rich details that. Um, existing models, which much more, are much more calibrated to unrelated previous policies, um, are not going to pick up. So it's going to pick up. The fact that it, it matters, the United States is on a very unique path. We haven't been on this ex hugely exploding debt path um, in the same way in, in the past. And so previous policies are often very different in terms of how they change marginal tax rates, but they're also, it's also a very different world uh, uh, back then. And then finally, we um, I completely agree with Steve and, and Tom as well, the importance of fleshing out sensitivity analysis, really fleshing out the assumptions. And so you can go on our website, for example, and play with different assumptions and actually uh, you know, see, see what the, the, those differences are. I think that's incredibly important because ultimately at the end of the day, you want arguments not over ideology, you want arguments over assumptions. And if we can actually get arguments over assumptions and have a really clear understanding of what are the differences in these models and the differences in assumptions, that's an informed debate. Um, some people can have, you know, what economists call elasticities, very different views on that. Uh, that's fine. Um, you can dial that differently in our model. If you're liberal, you could do one thing, conservative another thing, but at least now we're having a rational debate on assumptions and not over, and, and modeling details and not over uh, ideology. Um, and I'll ask a follow-up question. Could um, I just, just, yeah, yeah, oh, please. Can, can I also, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I just want to say that, you know, we, you know, from our point of view, we welcome Penn Wharton coming in. Uh, I think it was back about 04, CBO started coming, doing long-range modeling. I think from our point of view, the more people who are in the game, the better. We have more people to talk to, more people to compare assumptions with, to discuss, debate uh, about what would make sense. Uh, and I think our, our, our projections obviously are, are a much longer uh, view out there. So one of the things we often talk about, and it's a little bit of a joke in our office, not to put a ruler on recent trends to try to see what the future is, but at this point in time, maybe as much as any, and this perhaps speaks a little bit of what Ken's talking about, is do we have fundamental things going on in our society now? Uh, you know, birth rates have been low, low in, you know, inflation rates are low. There are lots of things going on now, and one of the things that we always struggle with is when we see something for three, four, or five years, is this just a temporary blip and we're going to go back to what the long-term average has been, or is there something fundamental going on? And for us, that's the most important thing, is to think about what were the conditions of the past that contributed towards that experience, and then what do we all think holistically are going to be the conditions in the future 
that will possibly result in, in different assumptions for the future. And that's really what it's all about. Um, so um, a follow-up question about how we pinpoint our elasticities yeah. and um, how we you know, start our projection backward in time. Um, how, do we, how do we calibrate and make those decisions um, for, say, labor and savings elasticity? Yeah. Um, so that's also on the website. We have discussion papers. Actually, on the simulators, there's links to uh, resources. Uh, a very rich literature on things like labor supply elasticity, savings elasticities. I see some people here, in fact, who contributed to this literature. Um, and so what we, for us, the idea is we don't have to take a stand because ultimately we want people taking debates, you know, debating about these things. And so the idea is we provide the platform. You can actually change the elasticities um, to, to look at different outcomes yourself. Um, it is true. One of the issues is that uh, people say, okay, but you have a baseline setting. You kind of, that's in some sense, you know, a recommendation. You, you have a default. How do you come up with those defaults? And there it does require a subjective decision, and, uh, and that is based on, on the literature, kind of an immediate value. But ultimately, you know, we've had people from both the left and the right say, you know, love your model, but, you know, the default setting should be very here or it should be here. And that's fine, you know, I mean, that's fine to have those debates, because um, I think those are, are, are actually rational debates that we can go back to the literature, we can actually look at empirical studies to, to, to try to have a, a discussion about. And finally... Right, did you? Okay. Actually, just to make a couple comments related to the last two questions. Um, I agree with Kent uh, that uh, the micro-simulation models are, uh, are really critical in terms of our analysis and what we present to the, uh, to the members. A suggestion I'll make to Kent for future uh, uh, presentations is strike that word static from the presentation because none of the micro simulation yeah. models that, I, that you're using, none that we use, yeah. are static. It ends up being a pejorative and misleading uh, uh, label in the, eye, uh, in the eyes of uh, a number of the consumers of the information of the, the model. The model data uh, that goes into it is extremely uh, detailed. Uh, and one of, the high, uh, one of the things you didn't highlight in terms of differences between estimates that you had done compared to our mm -hmm. estimates, uh, for example, uh, net operating loss deductions, the changes uh, in Public Law 115.97 related to that. Well, I would guess that one of the main reasons for that is because our micro simulation model for uh, the corporate tax base is uh, a 10-year, actually, well, more than 10-year panel of every corporation in the United States with more than $50 million in assets. So you name any corporation that you can think of, and it's a data point in our model tracked for over 10 years. So we don't have to think about net operating losses for the steel industry. We can think of individual companies within the steel industry, and they're, they're different. And there's the law change impacts the different co uh, companies different, uh, differently. Uh, and so, and Moving then to the macro analysis, it's for us, the microeconomic work of our corporate model, our individual model, I like to characterize it as, as the feedstock uh, for the macro models. It's the source of determining the user cost of capitals, the uh, um, average marginal tax rates across different income uh, groups, average marginal and average tax, uh, tax rates for our labor supply uh, effects, for our saving, uh, uh, for our saving effects. Uh, and since I didn't bring slides, I did bring a party favor for anybody that wants to uh, carry it to office. Uh, we recently uh, produced sort of an overview of uh, the three macroeconomic models and the assumptions that underlie them uh, that, we, uh, that we used in our recent analysis and that uh, we continue to uh, develop. Uh, it's available on our website, but uh, I'll drop uh, a bundle of hard copies up here for after the session. Could, could I just add, you know, on the idea of the model, the model of the model, uh, I think I'm sure we'd all agree there's, there's no sort of perfect model. I, I know our model is a mixture of micro and macro. Sounds like Tom's is too. I think most models are that. And really the, the key is to try to develop the model given the data that are available that makes best use of those data to make the best possible projections you can. Uh, where, you know, Tom and we wish we had access to individual income tax records uh, so we could actually have micro model on that. We don't have that. 
uh, uh, Tom has that, and Austax Analysis of Treasury has that. But we do have individual records for things like work histories for individuals, and so our micro model is is more focused in the areas where we actually have the micro data available. So I think we're all all you know. I don't, again, I don't think there's a magic model, one size fits all. But I I think that all entities. OMB, CBO, uh, and all the entities here are really, as far as I know, making the best possible use. I'm looking forward to seeing more of the progress you make, Kent. Thank you. Um, so this sort of gets at, at the same issue. So there's many models. There's, you know, three models or more, depending on how you count them, sitting at this table. Um, do certain models have strengths or are better at doing certain estimates? Are there strengths and weaknesses? Is there something good to be found everywhere? Sure. I mean, uh, well, there are, there are crappy oh, oh, models. Yeah. Yeah. There are what? <laughs> there can be crappy models. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. um, let me just build on the la uh, last point. One of the reasons we have multiple macroeconomic models is U.S. economy is huge. To model it, you have to make simplifying uh, uh, assumptions. Uh, and so we have three models that make different simplifying assumptions to highlight different, uh, uh, different aspects of the economy. It's nice when. Uh, we're looking at a, a proposed policy change. If they all say about the same thing, uh, then you can you feel pretty good uh, pretty good about that. Uh, if they don't say the same thing, then it's we think a lot about why why don't they? What are we highlighting? As a simple case, one of our models uh, has no uh, international sector. It's a closed economy uh, a closed economy model. That doesn't make it useless because one of the things it highlights is the observed empirical fact that there are some households that are savers and there are some households that are non-savers. And so if we're looking at uh, proposals that may change uh, pension systems, saving, uh, saving incentives, it's really kind of important to have a look at that that reflects the reality of the, of, uh, the world, that there are some of you out there in the, uh, in the audience that just spend every dime that comes in uh, and are uh, maybe borrowing constrained. And there's some of you out there, the rest of you out there are sitting potentially on large nest eggs. And you behave differently uh, in response to after-tax returns. I, I just I couldn't agree more with Tom. I mean, we have a, a pure sort of a short-range model that just looks out 10 years. We have a long-range model that looks out long-term. They're both sort of a mix of micro and macro. We also have a pure micro-simulation model uh, that, that we use. And all of these have positives. Uh, and just as Tom says, if you can look at the results of all of them, uh, it's actually more fun when they don't agree because then you can see what's different about them and they can speak to each other and you can learn from them. It's not fun when they don't agree and you have an hour to decide uh, what you're going to tell the members of Congress. <laughs> That's less fun. You know, a, fun. a distinction I would make is you know, a lot of the, the models that uh, have been used in uh, DC have, you know, over the decades. Um, in many cases, there, where they will look at a previous tax change or a previous spending policy mm -hmm. or something like that, and then view that as the basis for a completely different policy going forward. For us, the idea is you want to have a forward-looking model, especially given the debt path that we are on. Um, and then incorporate the borrowing constraint types right into the model. So we have these, these types who are borrowing constrained as well as in our model. Um, and, but then the, the, the proof of the, the validation is then saying, can we have this, uh, this forward-looking model? If we go back in time now, can we validate against, against the past data? Because that's a big difference than, than saying, uh, a tax change that we're doing today that is maybe very unique in history is going to behave the same way as a tax change in the past. And so uh, where a lot of the Keynesian models, for example, don't always pick up uh, uh, the right effects, in my opinion, is because they are not um, always the forward looking. They often get debt, uh, for example, wrong. And, w and one of the challenges, of course, is that when you have multiple models, how do you blend the results ultimately? And that becomes extremely uh, challenging. And, uh, and so far, no one's really, you would need hundreds of years of data 
um, to really do that uh, uh, well. So our approach is, a, is actually an integrated model that you actually build out lots of these elements into the, into the consistent model, and then you go back in time um, and, see, and validate against past policies, past demographics, and things like that before you then allow these forward-looking models to, to project the, the, the future. And then another question is, um, what is the mechanism that causes higher debt um, to affect growth, um, if indeed it does? Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. So um, the, the, the mechanism actually goes all the way back to Adam Smith and then later Paul Samuelson. And that is, if in fact you are not the small open economy, you're not a banana republic, uh, part of your capital stock has to be financed from domestic households. And in particular, the United States is a large open economy. We have 4% of the world's population, but we have a, almost uh, over 25% of the world's capital. Of listed capital, it's even higher. Of listed debt uh, or uh, traded debt is, is even much higher. So we're actually a large open economy. And if you look at the uh, marginal take-up of government debt, for example, it's only about 40 cents of every dollar that's purchased uh, by foreigners on equity. It's even a lot less than that. And so the idea is that if, in fact, the government is now floating additional debt, um, some of that household saving that otherwise would have gone on productive investment is now going to finance that government debt. It's like your, the debt means we consume more today and therefore are saving less today, and therefore we're going to have uh, a less capital accumulation. And so sometimes people say, well, again, Japan, they've gotten away with it. But in fact, that's a narrow interpretation because they actually have very high level of total national saving. Or people will look at you know, the recent recession and say, hey, wait a minute, you know, we had a big run up in debt. Interest rates were quite low. But of course, you're getting the causality just reversed. In particular, people came to the United States. After we kind of screwed up the world economy, they know they came to the United States uh, for as a, safe, uh, as a safe haven. But on an ongoing basis, the evidence is very clear where you're looking at uh, Reinhardt Rogoff, you're looking at the IMF studies, you're looking at other studies, that a nation can only carry so much debt. And once it hits, you know, uh, 90, 100 percent of that, especially at the U.S. household level saving, things get bad pretty quickly. And by the way, even Japan had its lost decade. It's not like Japan is doing just thumbs up. I mean, they've had their, you know, they've had their, their pressures as well, even with their high national saving rate. And so the debt issue is, is I think, the, the issue uh, really facing our Economy. It's also another reason why we believe in a comprehensive model, and not just tax, but the spending side, all of it together. Because, in fact, so much of the labeling doesn't matter. It, it, it's in many cases, yes, it can matter politically. I completely agree. 1983, trust fund's about to exhaust and so forth. But in terms of the economics, you really want to have a whole uh, comprehensive, you don't want specialized models. You really want a comprehensive uh, framework that uh, recognizes that a pay-as-you-go program is like that. Okay, one more quick question, because we are a little over time, yeah. so let's do this quickly. Yeah. Um, what is one critical, uh, one critical assumption that you make in your model, and you know, how do you handle arriving at the appropriate assumption? In terms of uh, reporting to the Congress, I think the most critical assumption, uh, and this actually leads to consternation sometimes with the policy makers, is that we start from the present law baseline. Uh, and so that means we are supposed to take uh, as a fundamental assumption that what the law says is what it's going to be and that people will be responding according to what the law says. Now that doesn't mean that the people might not have uncertainty about the future, but for example, since the reduction in uh, individual marginal tax rates and the changes in personal exemption, standard deduction, itemized uh, uh, deductions uh, are due to expire. That's a fundamental uh, assumption from which we work in terms of analyzing any future policy, uh, policy change. 
Uh, and um, I, I think that's really key uh, in terms of how, how we arrive at that. That's easy. <laughs> that's, <laughs> it's, it's, the, it's the baseline that's used by uh, the Joint Committee. It's used by the Congressional Budget Office for the purpose of reporting the expenditure side. It has the uh, benefit of putting analysis of different proposals on an, e on an equal footing. I would say our, our most critical assumption depends on whether you're looking at long term or short term. If we're looking at long term, it's all about demographics. It's about that age distribution. And for that, it's principally what are the birth rates going to be uh, and also immigration. What is immigration going to be? Those are the two contributors towards people coming in at the younger ages. Death rates, they're pretty steady. They're, they're really they're a much, much sub-level issue. So in the long term, it's all about the age distribution, which is what are birth rates and immigration going to be. In the shorter term, it's really about, uh, it's about the revenue side. It's about in the economy. Are there going to be workers? How much money are they making? If you look back when the recession came and everybody was, was concerned about the disability insurance trust fund taking a big hit, I think it was something like 90-plus percent of the hit on the disability insurance trust fund was from less revenue coming in because we had less workers and less earnings that was resulting in taxes, and less than 10 percent of it was from more people getting disability benefits. So in the near term, it's all about the economy, workers, and employment. Longer term, it's all about demographics. Yeah. Uh, for us, uh, certainly the openness of the economy uh, dominates even the elasticity estimates that academics have often cared about. Academics have including myself, have done tons of work assuming revenue neutral changes in tax law, and that that is just very far from you know, reality. And so in particular, uh, the, the openness of the economy actually is much more important than some of the elasticities. Having said that, that's something a user can play with. What we've kind of hard-coded in coming back to it, Tom's uh, a very important, uh, is, is subtle but incredibly important point is that as modelers, should, uh, on one hand, we could say, you know what, this is how Congress is going to behave. They're not really going to do this. And so, but at the same time, that's not our job to play Congress and say this is how they're going to change the law. So the current law assumption is kind of what we're as bean counters and having better, you know, good models and so forth. That's, what, that's our obligation. At the same time, uh, one of the things that we do with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is we said, okay, suppose though that people have the expectations, we will still model it as current law, but people have expectations that certain, some of the provisions that will sunset will in fact be extended. It actually turns out that didn't change things dramatically. Um, that, that issue has dominated everything, but still, you know, that is a valid point, and that is it can, it can certainly have an effect, and that's something that we didn't have as a dial control um, in our simulations. All right. Well, thank you very thank you. much. Um, this is really informative. Um, everyone, if you can join us for lunch in the atrium, um, there is some limited seating, and so there's additional seating available um, in HVC 201 around the corner um, if that becomes necessary. Uh, so come, enjoy your lunch. And the lunch will be great. It's, it's going to be a great conversation <laughs> on trade. <laughs> I'm so glad to be here.